What you see here is the beginning of a movement that women are human beings and that we have equal rights. As soon as NOW existed and I heard about it, I was in NOW. We in NOW teach women how to fight discrimination against their own companies, how to sue their companies. This was one of my favorites. Uppity Women Unite. We certainly did, didn't we? The women have a fundamental right to control their own bodies and to control their own lives. Every woman join our all right, the film is called She's Beautiful When She's Angry. It's an absolutely phenomenal exploration, a study of the women's movement, the feminist movement, between the years 1966 and 1971. Extremely powerful movie and a very, very important film. We're here with the director, Mary Dore. Mary, thank you so much for joining us oh, thank you on so much. Flick Nation. It's, Great. it's lovely to meet you. I. I of course, absolutely love the film. I have the impression that this is a movie you've wanted to make for a while. <laughs> Decades, I'm why sorry to say. <laughs> yeah. Why this film and why now? Um, well, the now is not, I'll start with why. Um, the why was, I've made a lot of historical documentaries. I started out like making labor films and a lot of political films. And about two decades ago when I was laid off by my local public TV station for the umpteenth time, um, like everyone is, you know, they always do those cuts, 60 people out this week. <laughs> um, I was actually at a film conference and I thought, what do I really want to be doing? Because, you know, this keeps happening. And th somehow I realized I had always wanted to make this film. I had thought about it before. And part of what fueled me to want it to make it is because I've seen so many great documentaries on other subjects from that period, and the women's movement is always kind of skipped over. I mean, even when you have a 10-hour series on the 60s, you know, I've timed it. Sometimes they give the women's movement two minutes. It's always obscured. And so that was sort of what, f you know, basically started my fervor. And at the same time, um, I had just a completely miserable time raising any money for it. So if anyone ever had any doubts about like how important is the women's movement, I could tell very quickly that at least to the funding community, <laughs> it was really not important because it took decades. I mean, literally, my kids are 21. Um, I have twins. And I was writing grants before they were born. So it's very easy to date how long a project this has been. You know, it's it, one of the first things that struck me in this film was this hasn't been done before. This movie is only getting made now. And that kind of shocked me. I, I, it I, shocked me. I thought right? because I had very good credentials and a good proposal and I went to all these uh, very progressive foundations who um, I even had personal friends at and they all kind of shook their head and said nobody needs this. It's been done before and it has been done. There were certainly documentaries made in the 70s. It's not like it hasn't been done and more recently in the last few years there was the Maker series which covered some of this. But there really hasn't been an all-inclusive, really broad view of how the women's movement started. There really hasn't, certainly never in theaters. Well, you know, it's uh, very interesting. Same impression I had when I saw Selma. I thought that I knew this story, but I really only knew a small percentage of this story. And your film struck me in the exact same way. It taught me so many things that I, I wasn't aware of, how important was the educational aspect of what you were trying to do. Well, I felt like I was trying to s essentially save a history that had been denigrated and ignored. So, I mean, that sounds a little vain, because there's been wonderful books written on this history. It's not like no one has done scholarship. Many people on our film, like Ruth Rosen and Susan Bramwell, have written great books on this history. So it's not that. It's just that in common understanding, you know, the term, I say this, it's a cliche, but it's true. More people know about feminazi than they know any of this history of the early movement. They really don't know it. And that's been proved to me many times because I have a lot of Q&As and I do a lot of screenings. And people always say to me, I knew none of this. It's always amazing to me. You know, it's uh, I, people that have a, quote, problem with this movement yeah. uh, will often pivot to a very simple, but why do they have to be so angry? They're also angry at themselves because they had been duped. That's what Ruth Rosen says in the film. And so the fact that Ruth Rosen was in her, getting her PhD in history and suddenly goes, how come I haven't learned about a single woman artist or a single woman writer or a single woman anything about the culture? Uh, you know, that it was almost shaming in a sense that somehow this whole thing had been put over on you and that you accepted that women were not important. So they were angry. But, you know, I, what, that's one of the reasons why I chose the title, because I love the title. It's actually, 
uh, there was a newsreel was a radical film collective all over the country in the late 60s and they made it a short documentary about a woman's uh, agitprop theater group and the title of it was she's beautiful and she's angry and I didn't know about it I was just looking at it for footage and then when I saw the title I was like the lights went out and we're like fantastic title because I wanted the title to be provocative just like I wanted the film to be provocative this was not a bunch of sweet ladies who just sat around they did all kind you know they forced their ways into men's bars for God's sake that seems ridiculous but that's what they had to do right and so they were angry and angry anger is a very positive emotion in many ways people don't see it that way but you don't make social change if you think everything is just great and they knew things were not great and so they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and not only were they angry. They were incredibly brave. And this film, like the movement itself, had to be brave because you have to touch on subjects that are still hot button for a lot of people in this country and a lot of people around the world. Well, it wasn't just the hot, I mean, I agree with you. They, I think they were incredibly brave and they did bring up a lot of issues that had basically been s smothered. I mean, couldn't even be discussed. Um, but I think in some ways, one of the ways they were the bravest was not just bringing up those difficult issues like, you know, um, incest or rape or all those things that, you know, that you know. It's also that they were reinventing the whole concept of gender and the whole concept of what women's lives should be like. And did they have to get married? Because in this gener in the earlier generation that some of the women in the film were from, um, some of them told me these amazing stories that when they were about to graduate from college at 21, there would be these humiliating rituals if they weren't engaged yet. because. Basically, if you weren't ready to get married at 21, you were an old maid. When we, so the, we came up with the title in 2000 when we did our trailer, and a number of the women that we know who are active feminists were horrified by the title because they didn't like the idea of beauty because, of course, the women's mm -hmm. movement fought against beauty standards, mm -hmm. and they did, and, and then others didn't like the word angry because that's the kind of stereotype of the women's movement, you know, ugly, angry, that kind of stuff. But most people got it and younger people got it because the whole point is sort of the women's movement was in your face. Yes. It was not a retiring movement. They took huge chances and they promulgated things that, you know, even sometimes they went too far. So I wanted the film's name and the style of it to reflect that. I have a feeling it's going to be the best movie title of the year, personally. <laughs> Last year my favorite was The Battered Bastards of Baseball. And I think now <laughs> She's Beautiful When She's Angry we'll is my 2015 movie title. Oh, thank you. They didn't need to be just angry and brave. They they were rein they they were inventing something that they had no knowledge of its history because this is another huge aspect. We haven't been taught the history of the women's movement, women writers, women poets, women artists, women activists, and they had not gotten that information in their education either. Right, they didn't know anything about the suffrage movement, right. which is like outrageous. And I mean, it was certainly true for me. I'm a little younger than the women in the film, but not that much. And I grew up, you know, I was reading all the great men of literature because I was a serious readaholic. And um, it wasn't until the women's movement I realized, I mean, I'd read, you know, Jane Austen, I'd read that was about it. I mean, mostly I read male authors and all of a sudden you're like, and then you discover one of the things they did is you discover all these wonderful women authors from generations ago that had been utterly neglected. You know, at all of that was a revelation to me and to everybody. I love the way that you focused on the uh, women and the activists that perchance we, we aren't as familiar with. We know, we know who Gloria Steinem is, we know who Jermaine Greer is, Many people may know Betty Friedan and some may know Andrea Dworkin, but the, the women that you focused on, it was so moving to see them at age 25, young, full of fire and passion, speaking in front of thousands of people, and then to, to cut to them at age 70 or age 75, and yet still completely aware, still completely on point, passionate, angry, these women are heroes, and we need to know who they are. Well, I should say, I agree with you a thousand percent on all that, but one of the caveats I always say is, I love the women that are in the film. They're all magnificent in many, many different ways. However, what I also have to say is there were thousands of others that I could have interviewed. This was, you know, this was meant to be a grassroots history, and some of them are a little better known than others, or wrote books that became more famous. But truthfully, I wanted to show how a movement starts. How do you start a movement? It doesn't come out of nowhere. And they were all political actives beforehand. So I made certain choices because there were themes I wanted to cover. But 
and I think the women we chose are just fantastic. But I want to be really straight about the fact that it's also true that so many other people did similar things or different, you know what I mean, allied things at different times or in different cities. Um, it was not meant to be a culling of the best and the brightest. I don't believe in that. The feminist movement was able to use humor in a way that maybe the civil rights movement couldn't quite go there. And even the gay rights movement, people wouldn't find it funny for well, the right reasons. And well, yet it's very present in the women's movement. It, it was. And that's why it's so funny that they've always been stereotyped as humorless because that's just, you know, if you go through the old newspapers, they're really funny. But not everything was funny. I mean, I, I asked Ellen Willis at one point during her interview, I said, well, you know, the fun issue. And, you know, and she said, yeah, we did do a lot of fun events. And you have to understand part of the reason they did these outrageous things was it was a way of getting the press to pay attention. Because in the beginning of this, you know, it's pre-internet, they have no money, they have no following, and how do you get people to know who you are? Well, if you can get an article in the newspaper, even a little tiny um, derisive one, guess what? More people you know you exist. Because as Mary Jean says in the film, you know, people didn't even know how to find now. It wasn't like it was in the yellow pages. They had no idea of how to even join a group. They might hear a word about it somewhere. So a lot of their brilliant strategy was to, in a sense, um, outwit the press by their actions. And also, it was a way of telling other women, guess what? You may have thought about this and never thought there was anything you could do about it, but guess what? We're doing it. You know, it's in watching, uh, in watching the film, and uh, the, you, you've obviously included a lot of footage from those years, there's almost a, a tendency to, to see that footage from 50 years ago and think, oh, isn't that quaint? How nostalgic. As a child of the 60s, and a, I was five to 10 years old, but I do remember those news stories. And I believe that I saw that David Frost show, that jarred. You do? Really? I do, and that, that jarred a memory. But right on the heels of this, oh, how quaint and nostalgic is the realization, we've barely moved an inch. We're still fighting for these issues. We're still, we're still arguing about these issues, and it still takes this brave response. Well, it's, I mean, the world has improved enormously. I mean, we show where we haven't moved ahead. It is amazing how hard women had to fight for ab abortion rights and, and how, I mean, they were out there. You know, they didn't just ask for, you know, to make abortions legal. They wanted free abortion on demand. Their domain, no, they wanted free educational child care for everyone. I mean, it was a heady period, and they had big um, goals and big ambitions, and they were things that they were absolutely worth fighting for. At the same time, you know, you cannot compare the condition of, that women live in, at least in the United States, with how it was back then. Um, you know, I mean, women do have jobs. Nobody doesn't expect them to. Yes, we don't still have child care, which is ghastly on every level and incredibly bad. But, you know, there's so many ways women's lives have improved and women are no longer. I mean, when I was growing up, at one point I was a candy striper at the hospital and I was madly in love with medicine. And I remember saying to this young man, oh, I, you know, I'm really thinking about being a doctor. And the first thing he said to me is, don't you mean a nurse? I mean, that was common. That wasn't like, he wasn't being mean to me. That was just like, why are you saying you might be a doctor? And so most women, including me, um, you know, you understood that women were lesser beings and that they were not as smart. I knew I was smart, so I had, uh, I was pretty confident that they were wrong on the other stuff too, even before I knew what feminism was. But I think for a lot of women, that was just inculcated. And how do you outgrow that? You know, there's so many aspects of the film because you touch on many, many different things. And when people see this film, the first thing they're going to realize is, yes, the women's movement isn't kind of one thing. It's it's a conglomeration of maybe a thousand smaller sub-movements that are all trying to, to, to write certain things. But one of the things that really, really jumped out of the movie at me is when Heather Booth was speaking about the Jane Project. It's an amazing story. This is, this is really incredible. And without going into it too deeply, abortion was illegal and there was uh, women were coming together I believe in Chicago right. to at least give women an option to have safe abortions but of course this was this was crime in those days and they were moving them around from home to home I mean it struck me it was almost like Harriet Tubman and the, the Underground, Underground Railroad. I was going to just say, it was. It was incredibly courageous. They took it in their hands. I mean, they found 
some through doctor friends they found some people who are willing to do the abortions but of course they couldn't be done in an office so they literally switched every day and then to top that off then at some point one of the doctors because they had bigger in every year it was getting to be a lot it was like a, it was like the best known secret in Chicago well it's and it's not just that they had to be brave they they also had to really sacrifice the rituals per quote that 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 they were showing us weren't necessarily just symbolic they weren't just burning their bras they were actually burning their college diplomas to make a point about the fact that someone with a master's degree or a PhD was making the same amount of money as a man with a, a high school education well it was very brave um, as we say but it's also I mean, that's also part of the story of why Ruth was so indignant, because how can you, you take immense pride, you're the first person, first probably at least the first woman, if not the first person in your family to ever go to college. You know, that was that generation where that was a big step forward. And then you realize that you actually haven't learned all these things that you should have learned. They felt so gypped. So yeah, it was a big deal because it was incredibly prestigious for them to be the first one in graduate school, come on. And at the same time, they were just so furious at why they had missed all of this information and had, in a sense, I mean, Ruth used the words duped, or even, you know, in a crazy kind of way you could say they colluded, but they didn't, because they really didn't realize what had been left out. And you made the film almost entirely with women. Was that something you had decided in advance or something that just became I germane as you were moving forward? No, I always wanted it to be shot by women because, you know, I'm part of the generation. I'm a little younger than some of the people who are ahead of me, but where women filmmakers were an anomaly, which is no longer the case. But one of the things that I felt was really important is to have women DPs in particular mm -hmm. um, because that is an area where in terms of the trades, and particularly in terms of, you know, say Hollywood stature, y you know as well as I do that women are still way undervalued and in the trades they're not doing well and there's not that many um, DPs. There's a lot of wonderful documentary filmmakers who are women and, and shoot their own stories. A lot of verite shooters who are brilliant. But this was a different, kind. this was a film where you have to light and you know it's more of a traditional mm -hmm. look. And there were not that many trained people. That was really shocking. I mean it actually made the film more expensive because I had to bring people in from out of town sometimes. But I thought it was really important and it really made the interviews absolutely more wonderful because there was, a, you know, it was our little CR group. Basically we had all these women and it was great. Mary, I absolutely loved She's Beautiful When She's Angry. I think it's a, an incredibly important film and we are, we're behind you a thousand percent. We're going to be pushing this movie all year. Thank you so much for coming on our oh, show. It's really lovely of you. Thank you so much. Issues. <laughs>